Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is uh, very exciting to me as well, particularly because I hope this is not my last visit. We're looking forward perhaps to coming back and, and doing other projects at, uh, at a later stage. But um, I'm going to try to keep this as informal as I can. So with your permission, I'm going to sit rather than stand and talk rather than lecture. But I do have a few slides I'd like to share with you and tell you a little bit about my methodology. So I have a title that I've given to this, Foreign Aid, which involves all forms of international assistance, monetary, non-monetary. And then I have a quote. I say, dealing with donors. Donors being all those pesky foreigners who come in with funny ideas, strange views of the world, and perhaps don't know very much when they leave. So I have put the question as a, as a problem. Now, it may not be a problem without solution. We probably won't decide that tonight. But I'm going to be focusing less on the problems of good or bad or power or control or money, although all of those things are a part of foreign aid, but try to think of it as a problem which needs to be solved in the 21st century world. So in order to, to do so, I'm going to go back a little bit. Not too far north of here was this guy, uh, Machiavelli. A few of you may have heard of him if you've been reading political philosophy. Niccolo de, Barnard, de Bernardo de, de Machiavelli, May 3rd, 1469, June 21st, 1527. Well, he was back in the young countries, which were, were not even around when Morocco started its own progress uh, in nation building. But he did develop some interesting ideas because he was advisors to Italian princes and kings. And he emphasized something which is still with us today. The need to exercise power. Machiavelli, if you don't know it, was a power guy. He thought about power. He tried to understand it. But he tried to also understand the countervailing forces of power. And so he also said, where necessary, the prince, the governor, the president, whatever the uh, head of the government was in those days and now, needed also to think about, where necessary, both rewards and punishments and relationships in order to preserve what Mickey Machiavelli thought of as the status quo. That is, a peaceful situation with what some people call a balance of power. So the first thing we start with is foreign aid is part of that process. It is part of what's sometimes called exchange theory. Again, if you've studied either markets or if you've studied political science, or if you study business, you know about exchange. Exchange is, is a tr trading of gifts. Gifts are universal all over the world, and they're things we do in families as individuals. There are things we do in cultures. We think there are things that we do in national and international uh, politics. So I, I like to think of foreign exchange, and in particular, what we now call foreign aid, as a kind of subsidy relationship, either as grants, a gift in a way, but remember, gifts don't come free, or as loans in some cases. Uh, in international markets, we have loans coming from places such as the World Bank. These often come at a sub, quote unquote, market uh, rate, uh, in international currency, and they are historically, these exchanges, seen as a way of 
des inducing, encouraging, desirable behavior in the international sphere of exchange relationships. These all, uh, these go back, these relationships go back to the ancient Mediterranean societies that incorporated this part of the world for centuries and centuries and, and centuries. So there's a long history of financial uh, relationships, which we today sometimes, and you may have heard this referred to in some of your international relations courses, as soft power, quote unquote, soft power. It's an interesting way of putting the term because I, I'm not sure, I think of money always as soft, but that's something we can talk about at a later point if you have a, have a chance. Uh, there's certainly part of international diplomacy. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time just thinking of the last 500 or so years, <coughs> years where this part of the world, as so many, was affected by its neighbors. The period from roughly 1500 to the mid-1960s. And those colonial empires that I know you talk about in your classes and think about because, of course, Morocco in many ways was reflective of the patterns of international relationships that developed, and in particular the last hundred years uh, of the 20th, uh, the 20th century. They, in many ways, defined what we now call foreign aid because they were part of the package of relationships, the carrots and the sticks that informed the colonial, imperial, and sub-colonial and dependent state relationships that I suspect you also have talked about in some of your classes in trying to understand contemporary society. Exchange is also part of social and political relationships at a uh, sub-national, regional, and national level. And you may or may not have heard the term patron clientelism, but patron clientelism is a form of exchange theory. Exchanges are made between uh, different families, different villages, and patron client relationships often define relationships between different levels of social, political authority. So we're dealing with a broad area here that has defined a whole sector of international relationships and has done so for a, a long time. So the, the, the use of exchange, the carrot and the stick, the uh, soft power, also often defines alliances. Alliances of an economic nature, alliances of a political nature, alliance as an instrument of, of diplomacy. And without going into a lot of detail at this point, by the 19th century, the, the so-called imperial system internationally as it was being developed was also being defined in, in terms of financial international uh, relationships uh, coming into the 19th century, the world began to be linked through finance, through investment, through loans, particularly some forms of concessional loans that came to, to dominate state-to-state -state relationships, especially in Latin America, but certainly in Northern Africa, parts of uh, the Middle East, parts of Europe, and also parts of uh, Africa and Asia uh, more broadly defined. Exchange relationships were and are important, and international finance, as we know it today, is part of that process. And it started, in many ways, with the basics of communication. The, the pictures that I'm giving you here are two different early railway systems that were financed through Europe, through Britain, in order to both allow penetration into a country to explore it, 
and also to take stuff away because often in the 19th century, goods, materials, wealth was being taken away from many parts of the world, much of it as you know, uh, crossed eventually the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, ending up in the great uh, financial, uh, financial cities of, of Europe. So what is our issue? At the end of the Second World War, discussions developed about what was sustainable international development and how might it occur. So there was a theme that began to be developed that because of its 19th century financial relationships with various parts of the world, a number of the European powers, as well as the North American financial giants, including the United States, for example, would assist in international development in order to promote economic growth as a policy in order to ensure that there was political stability. And then as we move forward into the 20th century, debates about ideology came to the fore and how Eastern Europe, Russia, the Soviet Union, Western Europe would have relationships with Asia, Africa, and other parts of the world. There are two ways that we can approach the problem, and we're going to be talking about them both tonight. We start with a policy and a, an implementation discussion. That is, how do, how do you do foreign aid? Not whether to do it, but how to do it if you're going to do it in a manner that is fair, because it's not always, in a manner that is ethical, which it's not always, in a manner which promotes development. The second dimension becomes also very important. Is foreign aid, as a foreign policy, constructive? Is it destructive? Can it be both? And is it not perhaps worth thinking about whether or not it should be done at all? Now, we're not going to answer all of those questions, or even maybe most of them, but I think they're worth thinking about. And as we move forward, these two threads define ourselves in terms of state-to-state -state relationships and between what we now call civil society organizations, particularly those concerned with humanitarian and other non-governmental organizations operating within a country and within uh, the state system itself, whether in times of uh, disaster or in times of uh, military uh, threat or military uh, alliances or in terms of influencing in so-called power relationships uh, countries within a, an alliance system or within the international system as a whole. So, Social change and stability are part of the process, or at least the stated goal of, of uh, exchange systems. It, and they occur at all levels. They're part of human relationships. I think we all have engaged and exchanged relationships at one kind and in one way or another. And so they are based on subjective and human ways of, of interacting with each other at all levels of society. So the exchange theory, leader member exchange as it's sometimes called, you can see it up on the board, uh, there are two ways of thinking about it. We have leaders and we have followers and we have exchanges. But sometimes we have other kinds of relationships and without commenting or editorializing too much, uh, I believe uh, uh, <coughs> the woman is saying to uh, the Dave McDonald's partner at uh, McDonald's uh, Hanbury joint, of course I can accept you for what you are. You are someone I need to change. Change and exchange are in many ways parts of the same process. Now, we're going to switch a little bit now to the, to the more practical levels, because we are talking about practice. I know many of you are concerned with 
ideas and theories and values that are practical. You're eventually going out into the world looking for jobs. You're looking for satisfying jobs and interesting jobs. And the, the issue of foreign aid, the, the, the bringing of resources to a country from another country or from an international relations system is used all over the world. And as you know, there are foreign exchange programs here in Morocco and in most of uh, uh, the rest of the countries of, uh, of Africa. I see foreign aid in three or four ways. Let's, let's start with three of them. Foreign aid, along with security and along with uh, uh, other forms of diplomacy, is part of the balance of power as it's defined primarily by the, the nation-state system, but also by the powers that influence the nation-state system. You could call them the, the five great powers of the United Nations. You could think of the blocks that have been defined historically uh, in Europe, uh, Asia, and other parts of the world. But they're, again, going back to Machiavelli, they are part of a broad process that I call carrot and stick. Carrot representing the gift, stick representing, well, we all know what the stick represents, not good stuff. But there's a second way in which foreign aid influences us. It influences all parts of the world, both the parts of the world where the finances come from, but also the parts of the world where the finances go. And that's what I call the commercial promotion process. You may or may not have run into this part of the economic exchange system. Because a lot of foreign aid is used to buy things. They buy big things, they buy little things, they buy airline tickets, they buy scholarships and exchanges, uh, and of course they influence through this process international trade. Perhaps in a way that is not always as fair as it might be. You might be growing cotton very economically in one part of the world, uh, but then uh, your competitor or your foreign aid partner wants to provide you with cheaper cotton from its own part of the world, from its own farmers. The same thing can happen with food. The same thing can happen with just about every commodity. Automobiles, you know, computers, uh, digital watches, whatever the case might be. That commercial pro uh, promotion fits into a broader par uh, paradigm of what some people call the international political economy and international trade and international foreign aid are parts of that similar in, uh, process of exchanges that have been important, particularly in, since about the middle of the 20th century in governing financial relationships. There's also a third uh, approach, a third way in which you think about foreign aid. It's what I call this sort of this, the theories of humanitarian relationships. Um, this is the hardest one to explain in a sense because I'm not sure we aren't creating myths often when we talk about humanitarian assistance. There is what is sometimes called <coughs> judgmentally a moral imperative that some people see in providing assistance, international assistance to different countries around the world. Or at least they say that that is what they're doing. Whether or not they are, and whether or not one thinks it's appropriate within the context of the uh, international political economy, may or may not be the case. And again, that's a judgmental call uh, that we can't probably make tonight. But you'll hear about humanitarian assistance. You will hear about uh, floods, and then the Red Cross comes in, the International Red Cross, the International Red Crescent. They come in with money, and they come in with people, and they try to do the best they can to help. These are genuine people. There are people who do good things. But whether or not the system, that, as we understand it today, can be said is humanitarian is something that one has to think about and, and to talk about. So 
the, the whole, the, the final process that is important for us to talk about is whether or not foreign aid as a mechanism, as a technique, as a practice, as opposed to, say, international trade, whether or not it is part of any theory of economic growth or economic development or what is sometimes called modernization. Modernization, again, is something that is relative. It's an imperfect as a concept. Uh, it's not something I feel comfortable with suggesting has any absolute status. One person's modernization may not be another person's modernization. And we all have different views. And that's really important in terms of thinking about economic and social development. That being said, there is a two-edged relationship in terms of modernization that is often discussed. One is the relationship between the individual uh, and the socialization process that creates the person. And then there is the relationship between individuals and groups and the nation. The extent to which national ethical moral values impact upon the individual. So our assumption has been perhaps not entirely the case, and perhaps less so in some parts of the world than others, that uh, there is set, said to be an urban person who is modern, not necessarily sec secular in any, uh, any religious sense, but secular in the sense of doing things in the job that separate themselves from their society and from their, their culture, but it's, it's an antiquated model for many people because it, it really came from northern uh, areas of the world, particularly Europe and parts of uh, North America. And it's, it's one which you have to be very careful about, I think, particularly when you're talking about economic and social change. But it's part of our debate and, and something that we see and have to think about from, a, from an international and a comparative uh, perspective. Now we have to go back a little bit and think about the impact of, of history on that exchange uh, process. Colonialism, whether it was here, as it was, as you all know, uh, whether it uh, defined authority in the developing world, and whether or not that economic relationship is in, uh, bedded in that history of colonialism, it's very clear to me at least that the foreign aid and technical assistance programs which currently exist here and in other parts of the world came out of that colonial heritage. And you may say, uh, you think there were some issues with the colonial heritage? You may say, well, the French were better than the British, or the British were worse than the Dutch, or you know, probably say, they probably all, all of them should have stayed home. But of course, they're, they didn't, and they, they're not. So we have to think about that historical, complex relationship of the world that we're talking about uh, tonight. That legacy of history, I will say, and I want to talk a little bit about it, uh, is a mixed legacy at the best, and is part of what I call the moral ambiguities the lack of clarity of morals uh, that frame from uh, the whole system of international assistance for an aid after 1960. So, and I will say, uh, and it's interesting, you know, I'm speaking English and you're all studying in English in one of the most important francophone countries in uh, North Africa, in a country which also has two proud languages of its own, which are uh, particularly important in the world, the world is complex. If, if you just think about the linguistics of what I've just said, the values are complex. What we've gotten from the 20th century is complex uh, and not always easy to, uh, uh, easy to discern uh, and break apart. But colonialism, we have to admit, and we, I think we have to understand, had a very simple method. 
colonialism for me is represented by someone called the crusher. And foreign aid comes out of this crusher. And this is the person that I think of when I think of the crusher. Henry Morton Stanley. You may or may not have heard of him. Some of you may. He was actually a naturalized American, but he was working in the Congo for many, many years. This was not a gentle person. He was called the crusher of rocks. Bula Matari in Lingala, which is uh, Congolese, uh, one of the major Congolese languages, called Henry Morton Stanley the crusher of rocks. The rocks, of course, were the Congolese people. This was a violent system, it was a violent situation. Uh, Congo, as you may or may not know, was con uh, uh, colonized by the Belgians. Not the French, not the Americans, not the English but the Belgians, and of course, they created, or the, Leopold II, who was the king of the Belgians, created what he called the Congo Free State. The Congo was not the Congo when he created it. It was not free, and it wasn't even a state. And yet, the, the definition of colonialism does start with that historical base of power which is why the power relationship remains embedded in many ways in international relationships and in foreign aid. Foreign aid is dangerous in the sense that it can do a lot of damage. I'm not suggesting, we can debate it, that it can't do some good. Health has been very successfully assisted by foreign aid, but yet it is a dangerous territory to move into. And this is the second one, ironically, we're in a part of the world where this, uh, this is a very debatable area. But colonialism in many parts of the world also followed religions. And in particularly in much of Africa, which I know some of you are interested in, much of it followed the, the missionaries that came from Belgium, from France, from the UK, and other parts of the world. They created a system in Africa, in Asia, and other, and in Latin America, of what we now call nonprofit actors. Many of them were based on Christianity, and they had a major in turn a major impact on foreign aid policy. Particularly in the 19th century, they sold their, dare I say it, their religious values through education, health and other kinds of what we would call now foreign aid programs. And in particular, the, uh, uh, the, the, the issue of political values and political change. And I'll give you one example of what I think was a, a disastrous situation. You're free to disagree with me. But not far from here, the, the, the development of an independence movement for what is now called the South Sudan, Southern Sudan. You may or may not be aware of it, but there, is, there was a religious factor that was involved here. A number of, of Protestant, primarily Protestant missionaries worked and uh, operated in the South Sudan for many, many years, and as part of the complex process in the Horn of Africa, gradually came to ad, uh, advocate for a separation of South Sudan from North Sudan. My own view, Partitions are generally not good, and this was not a particularly good one. We are where we are now in South Sudan. Uh, I spent some time in Juba looking at it about two years before independence. It was not, it didn't look good. Partitions are not good things. Uh, and, but again, that's not the first time this occurred in Africa and other parts of the world. So these kinds of advocacies are part of a process of assessment we can think about the power relationships, but we also have to understand the origins of values in foreign aid from a, uh, from a uh, particularly from a Christian religious perspective, that this is part of a set of influences that we have to weigh as we debate uh, the, the, uh, the future. The, the, the colonial powers also brought in attitudes and ideas about gender, gender and race, particularly in parts of Africa, 
They also brought in missionaries who had a clearly defined view of their role in society. Now, I can't know for sure if this woman is a missionary, but my suspicions are there. Uh, and I'll leave it to you uh, to judge one way, or one way or the other. So, in an assessment, and I'll stop for a second and see if there are any questions. We, we have to question, we have to understand empirically what's happening, uh, and we also have to admit that there's still a lot of things that we need to know about foreign aid, technical assistance, as part of broader issues of international trade, international commerce, international political economy uh, more, more generally. And I have a few more things to say, but I'd like to give us a chance to stop at this point, see if anybody has any comments or any reactions. Or, uh, and I, believe me, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Uh, but I'll try the best I can. If anybody would like to, uh, <coughs> during this period, uh, raise any issues or questions, I'd be happy to do the best I can. Please. What did you mean when you said that we have to think about or talk about, or talk about it before we went into the humani humanitarian theory? We, uh, we, I think before we assume that humanitarians are humanitarian. I think that may be a simplistic way of saying it, but we have to be aware of a label which is either imposed on oneself or on others. So humanitarian aid may, it may not be the best form of relationship. And there are many people who argue that foreign aid, in fact, does damage rather than helps. There are some who argue that the commercial factor itself or the terms of trade themselves outweigh the positive elements in a particular foreign age aid package. Because you're dealing with, you're, you, when you're transferring wealth, part of exchange theory, it means you're transferring the things that wealth does and doesn't do. So if you, for example, um, uh, get a a lot of foreign aid in, in terms of maize or corn here. Uh, you can always tell, for example, American corn when it's sold or given away because it's yellow, right? Very bright yellow. Now, what is that going to do with the domestic market in a country when you bring in all of that food, which is humanitarian food and supposed to be free, what's going to happen to your local farmer who's producing the indigenous grain of, 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 of a kind, and how is that going to affect the local market, the, lo the local uh, trader in a, in, in, in a market in, uh, in Fez, for example. And those kinds of things are involved in a lot of the foreign assistance. How does international medicine man manufactured by large pharmaceutical companies, for example, impact the availability of medicine for people who don't have a lot of money. So those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. You want to think and double think about the appropriateness of this and think about within the context of both market principles and also the value systems that, that come along with it. Not that there are any simple answers, and I'm, I'm not certainly not going to say, well, maybe we shouldn't have any vaccines because they come from, uh, you know, large, French pharmaceutical companies, no. But thinking about the broad political economy is part of what we're talking about here when we talk about foreign aid. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, so if we ever mention the humanitarian part, when or is it appropriate to mention the yeah. white man's burden? Yeah. If we ever talk about it? I, w I do talk about it. In fact, uh, I talk a lot about it. We will talk a little bit about it. There are, there are three components, as we said. One is, of course, the commercial. The other is the moral set of values that include discussion of religious values, social values, and, and other things. And then there's that other one, there's that stick. You remember the stick? And of course, the stick is the third part of the power relationship. We talked about soft power. We have not talked about hard power. Hard power is the military component which becomes introduced for various reasons 
in order to resolve situations. I suppose it's simplicity, but that cannot be resolved by soft power. The ultimate resort uh, uh, to hard power is what the state system internationally do does, unfortunately, and what individual states often do uh, through their own decisions, through alliances, or through being forced into it by another state system. So that is a part of it. And uh, we'll, we'll perhaps try to come back to that a little bit more towards the end. But mention just one thing. One of the logo kind of phrases that has developed uh, in the last 15, 20 years about uh, foreign and security policy is called the three Ds. You may have run into the three Ds. Defense, diplomacy, and <coughs> development. Development being, being foreign aid. And you guess which D comes first? It's not development and it's not diplomacy. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, please. Um, first, I would like to thank you so much for your presentation. And also, Sorry? I would like to thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Still, I'm not finished yet, but thank you. For the first part. And secondly, I would like to know, if, like statistically speaking, how can we how can we analyze and study Southern Sudan's national and political economy? How can we? Study and analyze South, uh, Southern Sudan's national and political economy. Uh, so the southern political economy? Yeah. Um, well, of course, there is no one place you're, go you're going to go because there's a, there's a tremendous variety of people writing on it. I would say there are three ways of approaching it. One, you have to approach it by studying on the ground what, is, what are happening in individual communities and societies uh, from North Africa to South America to Eastern Europe, whatever the case might be. I do think language, I think uh, understanding governance systems, I think understanding societies are, are important. I also think uh, what, another way of approaching this is through trying to do research yourselves, eventually in the field, but also from understanding relationships, economic, political, and social relationships both quantitatively and qualitatively, and trying to develop your own ways and methodologies of, of studying this. And, and finally, I think you, you can, there, there, there's a laboratory here in Morocco that you can look at. And Morocco is in a very important strategic position from uh, internationally. It's central. I, I know people say that, but where, where Morocco is located here, goes all directions, both socially, economically, politically, and strategically. You know, I go up to Tangier and I look across and there's that other continent up there, the one that we don't talk about, or we talk too much about, perhaps, sometimes. You know, what is it, uh, how many kilometers is it to get to, uh, to Spain? Yeah, it's there. And it's, it's not neat, but you know, you're not down in the in a southern part of India, you're not down in South America in uh, the, uh, uh, you know, near the Cape of uh, uh, Good Hope, or the, uh, Cape uh, uh, Horn. You're, you're, you're right at the center of the world. And, yeah, the center of the round world, of course, if you can figure out where that is. But, but central in terms of commerce, central in terms of communications, central in terms of cultures, as you, as you no doubt won't know better than I am. So, right here. Start right here. But I think getting out and looking from the community on up rather than from the top down is, is one way of at least thinking about, uh, about, your, uh, about your study of the, of the processes. And restudy, because sometimes these are not as simple as they seem to be. And often words are used very uncritically. Uh, theories are thrown about very quickly. Uh, and you really do want to, like, that's why I like the word rethink, which I'm not sure what exactly it means, but it means continue to think about it, and, and, and continue to talk about it, and continue to read about it, both online, but also in, in hard form in books and articles and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, 
the impact of colonialism remains important to me, and, and, and I think it stands out in terms of images. Uh, humanitarianism justified colonialism. It was a response in many ways to the slave trade, the, especially the transatlantic slave trade, uh, which was fought in many ways admirably by the abolitionist movements in North America and Western Europe. Uh, people who thought slavery was unconscionable, unacceptable, and had to end. But part of their answer to that was, in fact, control of other parts of the world, and that's a lot more problematic. But it's also linked to our whole tendency to think about humanitarian intervention, and it's also linked to wars. The great wars of the 20th and even the 20th first century were often justified by certain basic moral, ethical, and in some cases, religious principles. And yet, as we think about missionaries, we, we, we think about this kind of an image far too often. This is probably in South Africa, a long way from here, probably around 1900, 1901, but it could be other parts of Africa, it could be other parts of the world. North America, South America, uh, the Caribbean. But we also must think about this image. And I'm going to test you a little bit. Uh, this is a person who in some parts of the world is very well known. And this is a theory of imperialism which is very important to not forget. So one, who is this person and what is his theory being demonstrated in this political cartoon? And anybody is open to give it a try. Are you running to him? You know the continent, you recognize it. Yes. Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes. Score. Bing. And what is his theory? Cape to Cairo. Cape to Cairo. And again, remember, what the British looked at was the railway. So this was his view of the Cape to Cairo Railway, which never became fully built, but they built a lot of it, as a symbol of what Britain and Cecil Rhodes himself uh, thought of the theory of colonialism in Africa. Now, he couldn't, he didn't go the other way, but it, it could have, and that reason probably he was going that direction was you know, he did have his friends across the channel in France who had a little bit more success on the other side of Africa than the British did. So we'll leave it, leave it at that. So, uh, colonialism, let's be honest and let's be realistic, is also this. Uh, you may, probably don't recognize this, but this was Kenya. This was the early 1950s. Uh, what was called by the uh, British, the Mau Mau Revolt. Their chief enemy then was Jomo Kenyatta, later the first president. But uh, Mau Mau was the so-called Land and Freedom Army. That's what they called themselves. And this was one of the conflicts of Africa in the 1950s. There were three or four big ones. And of course, you know, your next door neighbors went through the most difficult very important ones, uh, the Algerian Revolution uh, back in the, uh, in, in the 1950s and early 1960s. These define 21st century relationships in terms of both tactics, in terms of values, and in terms of international, international relationships. So we, we understand colonialism and foreign aid and foreign relationships in the post-Cold War world are important to understand. But with that, I'm now going to turn to uh, a second set of issues, which is we are here in 2019 in the 21st century, and where are we and what are we trying to deal with it? How do governments deal with soft power? what I sometimes call foreign aid. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the how it's done. This is the other part of the uh, equation. 
And we can talk again about the morality of it, the validity of it, the uh, success or failure of it. But it is done, and it's done in some interesting, sometimes confusing, sometimes not so efficient ways. So I'm going to talk about implementation issues. You have a donor system, which is defined in two ways, by multilateral organizations. You know them, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations Development Program, and so forth. These are organizations of large, worldwide systems manufactured by and managed by the international system. But by and large, those parts of the system that have vested control. And then you have individual countries, a dozen or so, individual countries that do provide significant amounts of money for what they call foreign aid. The foreign aid goes to what donors think of as their clients. And I'm not sure that's an appropriate label, but it is the label that is used. Sometimes they call them cooperating partners, and they have cooperative agreements. Sometimes there are other names, and the clients or the partners often have names too, but those we won't go into at this point. There are four things I want you to think about. Um, governments operate through their clients, that is through the cooperative countries that receive or agree to receive or ask for foreign aid. But a lot of what governments do, and I refer to the federal government here, in this case the United States, they also have their vendors. They operate with contractors. They have operate with private organizations that operate and deliver services for the foreign aid system. They might provide uh, trucks. They might provide pharmaceuticals. They might provide services. They might provide educational equipment. They might provide uh, uh, organizational assistance. Every country that receives foreign aid receives some of all of this stuff. Now you may not, may or may not know it, but if you go up to Rabat, you'll find offices with nice names, doing interesting work. They are being paid by the US government in order to do that work. They could very well be providing training for business administration. They could be providing uh, financial or informational support for political party systems. They do that here <coughs> in this country. They could be providing uh, def defense uh, uh, equipment in one country or another. They could very well be providing just about everything that is provided through the foreign aid system. And if any of you are interested, I can give you one or two names. The National Democratic Institute which has an office up in Rabat is, is one of them. They'll be happy to come and talk to you about their program for supporting political parties in Morocco. Open, got a lot of good brochures, and I'm sure they've got uh, videos and all this kind of stuff. When you think about that, that's a part of foreign aid. Vendors is a good term. Vendors like, you know, selling ice cream in the street or, or political support for political parties. We can talk about that later. But a lot of it's focused on cooperative agreements between a university, between a, uh, a foundation, uh, any kinds of organizations. Many of them can, can, can occur within a government system or between government systems. There is literally nothing which cannot be provided through the foreign aid process if there is a relationship of three partners, the donor, the, the cooperant partner, the donor partner, and some kind of a third party organization in some, but not all cases. So we, we, we can then ask about questions. Different ways of thinking about who provides foreign aid. And I think this is worth at least just taking a few minutes to take a look at because um, this slide shows you how foreign aid is uh, 
distributed in an absolute sense. And, you know, uh, this is the uh, image that a lot of American policymakers like to look at because lots of coin was very tall up in the air and uh, poor Denmark doesn't give very much, right? Oh, yeah. All right, but then look at this one. Look at the, I'm going to take you over here. Look at this one. Um, who gives per capita? Oh, oh, the stars and stripes are not quite in the same position, are they? Who gives the most under per capita, which is the real way to measure per person? Uh oh, well, Denmark doesn't do so bad. It's just about the same as Norway, however, and Sweden, and in the Netherlands, and so forth. So, the di discussion of foreign aid in a, in a pure economic sense is also part of what we want to continue to think about. That's a, that's a process that's uh, uh, depending on how you look at it. This is the way we like to see it in our North American home. This is the way uh, I think it's probably better to take a look at from an international, international perspective. Foreign aid is interesting, complex, and also very easy to, to interpretate, interpret in different ways. But where does the money go? This, is, this has also been changing, and that's even higher now. So Latin America gets about 11%. Asia gets a lot of, particularly South and Central Asia, a lot of money, 38, uh, 35%. Eastern Europe now only 7%. But Africa, North, South, East, and West, 46%. Goes to Africa alone. Now that tells you something as well. Africa is important. Africa is of interest internationally, and of course there are some real serious issues, social, political, and economic that are going on here that are of interest not only to uh, African countries but to European countries and, and countries in North America, and increasingly uh, interested in. Uh, places in Asia, particularly China, as you probably know, uh, China uh, and to a lesser extent Japan and India are important characters. So, but there's an issue which I think a lot of people haven't thought about. Um, you've got uh, you've got huge donors with huge bureaucracies. Some of them very well uh, trained, good, strong people but also perhaps not very knowledgeable. And they're often coming up against working with, in various parts of the world, a not so strong bureaucracy, a government bureaucracy perhaps. Time and time they come up, these recipient or client countries, with what I call the massive donor community, community pool of people almost overwhelming in terms of their ability to do stuff. They're well qualified. They have a complicated, very complicated bureaucratic process. Uh, and they are uh, a process-oriented uh, set of relationships which is important to think about. Now, we often don't have a good image of bureaucracies. I tend to think we overrate the capacity of the private bureaucracy and underrate the capacity of the public bureaucracy. But that's kind of an image we have. Not exactly always right up to speed on stuff. I don't know where that's set. It's probably set somewhere in South, Southeast Asia, perhaps. And it's not fair. And yet, bureaucracy can be underfunded. It can be starved of resources. It can be made up with people who are not as well trained as they perhaps should be in the 20th and 21st century. And so there is an issue of management. So we go back to my title, which I want to repeat now. How do countries that are involved in the foreign aid process and their managers, their public managers, deal with donors? Deal with the donor priorities and deal with the inefficiencies, and in some cases, the absolute uh, 
difficulty of patronage, corruption, that are sometimes run into, and how can those client relationships, those donor relationships, be dealt with in a non-dependent situation? Dependency patterns often are the bane of soft power. The donor wants to move the money. Moving the money to many donors is part of a, an organizational imperative which in, in unspoken terms suggests we don't care what you do with it, we just want to move it and say to our uh, bosses back home that it's been moved. That brings us to, squarely to the problem of sustainability, whether or not programs should be sustainable, whether or not there are ways in which the managers, the program managers in donor recipient countries can be uh, better uh, developed and better operationally uh, in order to deal with the massive resources that are available. So program managers is the term that I used for those people in countries such as uh, countries in Africa, Latin America, uh, the Middle East and uh, Asia that are managing the money and the goods and the people that are going into a political process and a, and a development system. First problem is that recipient countries often cannot say no. It's hard for people to say no to money. Uh, I don't often do it. Many of you probably don't often either. But you, you, sometimes you have to say no if you understand the relationship between the money and the consequences and there is a danger of, a, of either a dependent relationship or of an inefficiency or of a negative relationship on the local economy, urban, rural, the people who operate in it. So the recurrent problem for any program is maintenance. You have to be able to maintain what you construct. So it's easy, we're in a beautiful building here. It was constructed, probably not more than what, 15, 20 years old, mm -hmm. I'm looking around. And yet the fact is, it costs money every day that we're here. You know, th that electricity has to be paid for. The equipment in here has to be maintained and replaced. The library has to be maintained. Uh, your, your, your teachers need to get paid, at least they like to get paid. It's important. A system can fail if it cannot maintain itself and make itself better. Often foreign aid programs fail. They fail both absolutely, they also fail in terms of maintenance, in terms of sustainability. And so saying no can, in fact, be saying yes to a more efficient, more effective system. Foreign aid failure rates over the last 20 years are disturbing. They're increasing rather than decreasing. And there are more and more countries that are beginning to ask and say no uh, to foreign aid transfer. Not that I think that it, any absolute is important, but it's certainly important to consider. Program managers also have to deal with the foreigners that foreign aid programs bring in. These are good people. Some of them are very ambitious people. Others are very strong people. Others are very kind. But the stereotype, and I don't know this guy, but uh, he comes in with a cowboy hat and he's talking to the class. He probably doesn't speak the language. He probably doesn't have much to say about the studies that are being undertaken by the students. There is this image, though this is an, a good image of the relationship at the grassroots level of an international system which is focusing on soft aid. Uh, and so, Thinking about sustainability, and not, ne not necessarily Jerry Cashin, who's probably a very nice guy. Uh, he's probably retired by now.
but uh, there's an image there that suggests these systems have to be seen and restudied carefully and systematically. Dealing with donors becomes my theme. Dealing with them at a national level, <coughs> dealing with them at a local level, dealing with them even sometimes at a village or a, an individual level. So I have a few hints, a few possible things to consider. Dealing with donors is all about communication. You have to understand the donor language. It's not Arabic. It's not French. Oh, by the way, it's not English either. It is a special language which is created by the system that the operation occurs in. If it's from Copenhagen, it will have certain value systems attached to it and certain messages. If it's from the United States, it will have other messages, probably very different. If it's from China, it's going to be very different from the, from the first two. Now, that doesn't just mean understanding what donors say. That's hard enough to figure out what they're saying, even when they're saying it. But more importantly, because we're dealing with documents of exchange relationships, remember Machiavelli, you have to understand what the donor writes. You have to understand the donor's documents. You have to understand the donor's rules, the rules for themselves and the rules for the people that they interact with. You have to understand whether a donor is soft, like Denmark, or hard, like the United States, or whether it's somewhere in between. Maybe we could put the French somewhere in between, but I'll let you judge that. Uh, the Germans are considered to be somewhere in between. Uh, but we know the Chinese are pretty tough. They're, they're hard. And you have to understand the sustainability problem that we talked about. Sustainability is important. If this university is not here 20 years from now, it may very well have contributed to all of yours and others' education, but that's not the intention. I read on the signs outside, this has a sustainability label written all over it. It wants to be here. Make its place and make it a place for Morocco to do great things and to have great, greatly trained people doing those things. Sustainability is, is at the heart of this process. So the other thing you have to do is deal with those pesky people, the guy with the cowboy hat, right? The, 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 the well-meaning people who come internationally to work as in donor systems and in other kinds of systems. You have to understand that these are expatriates, and that is a real world of people. And expatriate simply means from another country. So. There are expatriates here as students and I think a few as teachers perhaps as well. So important to understand the internal organizational imperative of all of these people who represent all of these systems. And you're going to say, well, why? Because one is organizationally in need of ensuring the best outcome for those the organization serves. And in order to do so, you have to understand the good things that are happening, the bad things that are happening, and as the old uh, movie said, the good, the bad, and the ugly stuff. Because it's all around and it's all there. You don't want to get rid of the good stuff. You want to try to prevent the bad stuff, and you really don't want to have anything to do with ugly stuff that, that can happen in international relationships. You also have to, uh, I think it's important to say, be an aggressive and hard recipient as a foreign ministry official sitting in Rabat or working in a trade mission overseas or working in an embassy in uh, Beijing or, uh, or Washington, D.C. Or, or Paris. And you have to understand hidden agendas. So I spent some time working in Eritrea over in the horn, as you probably know. And that was, it was interesting for me to understand uh, all their uh, computers back in the 90s when I was with Olivetti. Why would they buy Olivetti computers? Oh, 
Capri was an Italian colony. They're getting a lot of Italian foreign aid. Where are they buying their computers? That's why they're buying Olivetti. It's an Italian computer manufacturing. Why do Scandinavians provide markets for butter throughout many parts of the world? Well, Danish butter is pretty good. I don't know if you have it here. But Lurpak butter is wonderful butter. Uh, and it was marketed originally through foreign assistance programs from Denmark. Commercial relationships <laughs> are important. Commercial and economic motives have to be part of the strategy of thinking about dealing with soft power in a broad sense. Now, I'm gratified to know that there's no Coca-Cola in this country. <laughs> you wouldn't bring this stuff in. It's got too much sugar, it's got too much syrup. They, they say it makes you gain too much weight. Good thing, right? Not here. But the commercial, obviously, you know, that came here probably late 1940s, I would suspect. Or maybe right. earlier, I don't know. 1942. Oh, well, that's right, because we came here right on the beaches. That's right, that's right. Set up a stand, sell Coca-Cola. There you go. So these these are these are uh, these are important. Uh, also, humorous. We have to laugh a little bit. We have to think about this as human relationships and all of their frailties. But but it's important to uh, to think about. I want to end up with just a story. Really, it's an interesting story. Uh, I call it qualifications in Mali. Now you all know where Mali is. It's not too far from here. There's a little bit of sand in between, but. Uh, Mali is an interesting country, it's an important country, uh, and uh, this is a story about a, a project to assist uh, uh, a village in, uh, in, in uh, I think probably, we'll say central, central Mali. Um, so, man went into, uh, or a woman I think it actually was, went in to look at a program that had been set up to uh, assist poor villages in uh, central Mali. When, I guess it is a he, as I can see from my script. They asked about microcredit, which you know is very popular now uh, and has been for some time. So how come there's no microcredit in the village over here with uh, uh, lots of people, lots of very poor people? And they said, the response was, the village didn't qualify. Why not? The village doesn't have enough well-off people who qualify for microloans. The lessons learned from this are very clear. It's the, one of the problems of qualifying is that you have to have money in order to receive support in a foreign aid program. And that has been a major criticism since the early 1950s of a lot of foreign aid. It eventually goes into a middle class, a lower middle class, very often it does not go very much further below. Doesn't go to the poor village, it may go to the village that's better off economically, or regretfully sometimes it may go to the village that is better off politically, has the political clout to gain access. So images are important, and uh, the Mali village story I think is an important warning about both uh, aspects of foreign aid, its sustainability and its commercial sensitivity. So you asked about the whole process of foreign aid, and I'm gonna, gonna wrap up in about three or four slides. So uh, how is the pie split? split? What I'm gonna say here is probably not surprising, but this is a, this is a pie chart showing uh, US foreign aid. And 22% of the non-military foreign aid from the United States now approximately goes to support foreign aid programs. That means the other part of it is going to defense stuff. The pie, defense, diplomacy, and development is almost always skewed heavily towards defense. And that's true in just about every part of the world. Yes, please. Does that say uh, 2010? Yeah, okay. I believe so. It's probably different now a little bit, probably not much. That's eight years ago, nine years ago now. So, yeah. But you can see it, it gives a good sense of uh, what's going on. Uh, this is uh, 
the Defense Department, not the State Department, or not the Agency for International Development. So it, it's interesting that uh, uh, the, the whole question of what is a pie, the, 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 the actual foreign assistance budget from the State Department and USAID, you can see it right down there, it's in the red. If you can't read, it's 1%. So we're talking about a system which has been changing rapidly over the last 25 years for reasons that we, we can talk about but are, are not entirely surprising. So we're also dealing with a, uh, we're, we're summarizing now to a certain extent, we're dealing with a situation in which a lot of relationships are defined either in terms of written contracts exchange relationships <coughs> defined, or grants of some kinds provided for specific activities, including things such as cooperative agreements, which involve universities and international universities and other programs. So uh, the pictures on the bottom just gives you an idea of different kinds of organizations that get involved in this process, including the, uh, the nonprofits. So the grants and the subgrants and the uh, various kinds of so-called gifts are, in fact, all uh, part of the soft power system that has, has evolved. Um, uh, the, the final question that I want to raise, and then we'll just do a quick summary, is thinking about foreign aid within the context of the international political economy. Uh, the international political economy often thinks about foreign aid and is very much worried that it is in contradistinction to free trade. Free trade is a set of values that has been with us for a long time. It's now being challenged in many ways in the 21st century world. And I think one of them is a misunderstanding of way, the way foreign aid is and, and, and free trade is defined and understand, uh, understood by different parts of World. My little cartoon here tries to capture that. So the uh, uh, little uh, uh, police guy on one hand says it's this person, this poor person who is, will not look too closely at what the sign says, but uh, it was you that caused the end of free trade. And of course, innocently, uh, sort of whistling a tune with the uh, fire hoses behind their back is uh, U.S. agribusiness and our <clears throat> very French-looking European farmers, especially the wine farmers and the others that uh, do all kinds of stuff to protect their, their various industries. So the, the final concern for foreign aid is, is it destructive of an international free trade business which is fair to producers all over? So we stop, uh, we look again here. We talk, oops, I think I went the wrong way. Yeah, I did. The um, final issue is the issue we started with. The issue of thinking about international development and foreign aid from a policy and an ethical dimension, and whether or not we can think about the policy, problem, policy problems and the moral ambiguities that have played technical assistance in foreign aid uh, really since the end of the Second World War. But if we really think about it, a lot of this goes back to, Ma uh, to Machiavelli and to the various reasons why exchanges are made between one country, one region, one alliance, and, and another. So there, I thank you in advance for tolerating this. It's been a, a bit of a long presentation, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any comments or questions if, uh, if you have any.